First off, I'd like to welcome everyone for coming out. This is a fantastic turnout, great evening, and uh, we were, are very proud to welcome Chris Fumble to come uh, share some stories about Cape Fear and some recent findings and, and uh, different things here at Cape Fear. Many of you have already met Chris, but I'll tell you a little bit about him. Uh, he's a native Wilmingtonian with a lifelong interest in the American Civil War, Cape Fear history. He attended our public schools, including New Hanover High School, class of 1971. He was the first soccer-style place kicker in North Carolina football history. <laughs> After receiving his BA in anthropology at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, he served as the last curator of the Blockade Runners of the American uh, Confederacy Museum. He su subsequently received his MA in American History at East Carolina and a PhD from the University of South Carolina. So that makes Chris a wildcat, a seahawk, a pirate, and a gamecock. <laughs> Chris and I have known each other a long time and during our project on the initial early stages, I, I stumbled across something that I thought was a buried golf ball and later found out it was something quite a bit uh, more interesting. So called Chris up and uh, he's been fantastic to come out and spend his time doing a lot of very dirty work below the surface and we have a lot of artifacts, some of which are on display. He'll get into many of the others and we've got many more that are, are currently uh, with the um, curator and hopefully we'll be back soon to us very soon. Without that, I want to introduce Chris Fondle. Thank you. I spoke to Joey a week ago and he said, we've got 55 people signed up. <laughs> when I walked in the door, he said, there are 175 reservations. We should have charged $10 a piece, we'd both be rich. <laughs> Neither one of us are getting anything but a good time out of this. Uh, it's, it's so great to be back at Kefir Country Club. Uh, my grandfather was a member. Uh, my father was president here in the 1960s. I grew up playing golf at Kefir Country Club. I grew up in Beaumont on West Renova Circle so I could walk with my clubs from uh, Beaumont over to Kefir and play golf. And I just have such very fond memories of uh, Kefir Country Club. And there used to be a golf tournament named after my father, who died as a very young man, the Gene Fonville uh, Memorial Golf Tournament. But uh, I don't think that's um, played anymore, is it? I don't think anybody knows who Gene Fonville is anymore. <laughs> There's so, so many new people in Wilmington. But I'm proud to be a native Wilmingtonian, along with my good friend Jay Talbert, who I've known since childhood, uh, since uh, kindergarten. In fact, he and I played on the very same football team where I was the first soccer-style place kicker in North Carolina football history. And um, Bill Calder, is it Bill here somewhere? Bill, Bill was my holder. <laughs> Wait a minute, that didn't sound right. <laughs> he held the ball that I kicked. So we, we go way back, and uh, it, it's, it's just a lot of fun uh, to be here with y'all tonight. And, and look, I, I would much rather carry on a conversation than a lecture. So if at any time during uh, the proceedings um, you have something to ask or something to add, please stop me, raise your hand, and uh, we'll be glad to, uh, to talk about it then. Uh, now, as glad as I uh, am to be here with you all tonight, I should not be here. Six weeks ago, two months ago, when Joey said, uh, look, let's, let's um, have a, uh, a meeting, uh, a public gathering, to talk about the discoveries that, that we made. Uh, how does January 16th sound? That sounds good. January 16th is my wedding anniversary. <laughs> I know it's a guy thing, but carry around a calendar with you guys and make sure that you don't book a session to talk about cannonballs and mini balls when you're supposed to be out wooing your wife of 38 years. My wife Nancy is here with me over here tonight.
God bless her for putting up with me for 38 years, but God bless her for putting up with me to talk about cannonballs and mini balls with y'all tonight when I should be out taking her to a nice dinner and so forth. So, anyway. Okay. Uh, History on the Green. How clever a title is that? <laughs> Just came up with that tonight. Uh, the Cape Fear Country Club, of course, you know, history is everywhere. It's underfoot, it's underwater. Did you know that we've got the largest assemblage of Civil War shipwrecks anywhere in the world? We have uh, more than 30 blockade runner wrecks along the Cape Fear Coast. That's the largest collection of Civil War shipwrecks anywhere in the world, uh, and I guess in any parallel universe. Um, but of course, history is underfoot no matter where you go. And uh, I remember my grandfather told me many years ago that when the course built here, of course, you know, the first one was at Hilton Park, uh, started in 1896, and they moved out here in, the, night, in the, uh, the teens. I think 1913 is when they first started to play golf out here. Um, and he told me that when they built what we know was the seventh green, that, uh, that it collapsed. And underneath it was a bunker that turned out to be a Civil War bunker. And I just always remembered that story. And then when I grew up playing golf here, I remember walking uh, from the 8th tee uh, down the fairway and along the, the earthworks that, that we all know about, of course, uh, I found a mini ball just sitting on top of the ground. And it just, uh, it just occurred to me that, you know, there was Civil War activity right here where we're all playing golf. In fact, if we could walk out the back of this building, you would see uh, a Confederate artillery battery called Dawson Battery or Battery Dawson, which was named for the Civil War mayor of Wilmington, John Dawson, Dawson Street. So that's Dawson Battery, and there it is there. Can everyone see okay? I know it's difficult for those of you in the back. And then from Dawson Battery going uh, westward, and we'll get into more details in just a little while, there's a line of earthworks between the first fairway and the ninth fairway that connected Dawson Battery with the seventh green, which was Battery McCree. And about this time last year, this strange guy <laughs> from Cape Fear Country Club called me up. And you know, he has, you know this, he has played every golf course where there has been a major championship in the world. In the world. That's unbelievable. And then that's like saying... <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, that's like saying there's the largest assemblage of Civil War shipwrecks anywhere in the world, right here at the Cape Fear Coast. That's an incredible accomplishment, and he's still going. Well, Joey uh, called me up and he said, Chris, uh, we're renovating the course to go back to the original Donald Ross Lynx design. And we were doing some work up on the seventh green, and I found a, a ball, an iron ball, that I think might be Civil War. Uh, would you come out and take a look at it? And so I did, and it turned out to be a two-inch iron ball like this. And I said, sure enough, uh, that's a Civil War grape shot, or a canister ball. And he said, well, we also found a World War I helmet. <laughs> the helmet turned out to be a bedpan. <laughs> well, we've been wearing this, this helmet. So that's not my problem. But in the days before there was trash pickup, people just buried their trash in the backyard and the backhoe operator operating in that area had dug up an old trash pit, and this bedpan was, was in the trash. But that was the most interesting artifact, and then he asked me, well, would you be willing to come out and do some excavations? And I, absolutely. Uh, I mean, this is my ballywick here. This is what I absolutely love to do. So uh, I came out and spent the better part of two months in March and April uh, digging the seventh green, and I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. But I want to provide a little context to the history of Cape Fear Country Club's Civil War history. So go back to April 1861, 
president, uh, right after the Battle of Fort Sumter, which was the first, major, or which the first battle of the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln declared economic warfare against the seceded states because we were a region of farmers, planters, and slaves, and we did not have the factories to manufacture the stuff that uh, was needed to fight a war. So the South was going to depend on the European marketplace to bring in military supplies and civilian goods. And uh, President Lincoln, knowing that, declared a naval blockade of the southern uh, states, which would be from the, uh, the Cape Henry in Virginia to the Florida Keys to the Rio Grande River. That was about 3,600 miles of coastline and about 12 dozen major seaports. And this was going to take a long time to implement much less make effective when most Americans thought the war would be over in 90 days, maybe one big battle. And the war turned out to be four years and cost more American lives than all other American wars combined. Uh, the numbers keep growing. It's about 750,000 now, and we don't even know the civilian deaths. So uh, the blockade took a long time to make effective. And what they did is they concentrated their efforts at the major southern seaports, like Norfolk and New Bern and Wilmington, Charleston, Savannah, Pensacola, Florida, New Orleans, Mobile. I'm not going to name all, all, all 12 of them, but, but you know. Um, and the response, the southern response to the blockade was to uh, use or employ ships, Confederate commerce vessels, that would smuggle supplies into the southern seaports on board ships known as blockade runners because they were attempting to pierce or run through the blockade. And uh, by war's end, the U.S. Navy Department could account for 1,600 blockade runners, uh, about 300 of which were steam vessels, which were employed by late 1863-64 because of their speed and their stealth. Before that, when the blockade was ineffective, you could use a bark or a schooner uh, or a corn cracker to break through the blockade. Uh, but eventually, the uh, investors, the speculators, the shippers, the importers, the exporters depended on speed and stealth, uh, not unlike the drug trade today. Uh, so these ships brought in much needed supplies like rifle muskets and artillery and bayonets, ammunition, gunpowder, blankets, medicines, and of course civilian goods too, because no war effort is successful without popular support. We all understand that. Uh, so uh, that people, even during wartime, could still go out and buy their um, smartphones and their iPhones and their Androids and their smart TVs and, and so forth. Uh, so they could still buy their hoop skirts and their kid gloves and find wines and liqueurs and so forth. Uh, and this was a very uh, potentially lucrative trade, but also a very dangerous trade, because if your ship got caught by the Union blockading vessels, then uh, the cargoes were confiscated, the ships were confiscated, the ships were turned into Union blockading cruisers to chase down speedy blockade runners. It was a cat and mouse game. And slowly but surely, Wilmington became the main port of entry for these blockade running ships. As Union forces captured New Orleans, uh, they sealed Savannah, Georgia to the blockading trade, blockade running trade. Uh, they put Charleston under siege by the spring of 1863. So Wilmington, they recaptured Charleston in 1862, not Charleston, but uh, Norfolk. So Wilmington more and more and more became uh, important to the blockade running trade. And Wilmington, believe it or not, in 1860 was the state's largest city. There were 10,000 people who lived here. I passed 10,000 people on my way <laughs> from Greenville Sound to the, to the club tonight. It took me 30 minutes to get there from Greenville Sound. I mean, I still drive around thinking I can be anywhere I want to be in 15 minutes. That Wilmington is gone. So there were 10,000 people who lived here, and it was uh, the, the busiest, 
seaport, which it is today, as you know. And by 1863, it was the South's most important seaport for the blockade runners that brought in these vital supplies. And it was just perfectly situated for the blockade running trade. Most of the trading partners with the Confederacy were European nations. Austria, Prussia, Spain, France, Belgium, but particularly Great Britain. And the common practice was that supplies would be put on large ocean-going merchant vessels and sent from, say, Liverpool to neutral transshipment points, which were open ports that also traded with the north, like Halifax, Nova Scotia, and St. George's, Bermuda, and Nassau, Bahamas, and Havana, Cuba, and Wilmington, close to the Virginia battlefront, and particularly by the spring of 1862, when Union Army and Navy forces captured, recaptured Norfolk, and then captured and occupied two-thirds of the coastal plain of North Carolina from the Virginia line all the way down to White Oak River, only 60 miles north of Wilmington. So they occupied all of that. But instead of going after Wilmington, which they should have done, they hopscotched over Wilmington and went after Charleston instead, because that's where the war had started. That was the nest of secession and public and political interests centered on Charleston. And that worked out well for Wilmington and the blockade runners that operated at Wilmington. They just transferred their operations to Wilmington. And Wilmington slowly but surely became the most important seaport in the South. And geography played a big role in its importance. Because at that time, there were two entryways, two inlets into the harbor. You had Old Inlet, the main channel then and today, and then six miles as the crow flies to the north, northeast, was New Inlet, which was carved by a hurricane in 1761, something we know a little bit about. Florence sat on top of us two years ago, a year and a half ago, for three days. The 1761 storm sat on top of the Cape Fear for four days. And it literally created a new inlet. And Cape Fearians, being very creative with the name for inlets, called it the new inlet <laughs> to differentiate it from the old inlet. But now there are two entryways in the harbor, but what that meant was that sand was displaced by the waves of the ocean from east to west. So that over the next hundred years, it started to shoal the river. It built up Bald Head Island at the mouth of the river, but it also made it very difficult for ships going up and down the Cape Fear River because they had to deal with very shallow areas. So in the 1850s, the Corps of Engineers said, you know what, New Inlet really should be closed. And then you let the natural forces clear out the channel, the main channel, so that ships can go up and down the Cape Fear River. And this is long before the days where you had readily available steam dredges, like the Corps of Engineers does today, to keep the channels clear. You, you depended largely on natural forces and jetties and so forth. And, uh, but that didn't happen until after the Civil War. And of course, now we all know that New England was closed by the rocks, which was the most ambitious Corps of Engineers project ever undertaken when they closed an inlet that was a mile and a quarter in width. And they took big giant wooden cribs and they filled them with quarried rock and they sunk them in the inlet and they built up a pyramid shaped breakwater and they capped it with cement and they closed New Inlet, but that wasn't completed until 1884. And now today you can go to the end of 421, end of New Hanover County, and you can walk across what we call the rocks. And by the way, did y'all know that the designer and supervisor of that project was Henry Bacon, who's buried in Oakdale Cemetery. His son, Henry Bacon Jr., was a teenage employee on his father's construction project. And in the 1920s, used similar construction techniques, wooden cribs filled with quarried stone, sunk them along the bank of the Potomac River in Washington, D.C., so that he could put 
What monument did he design and build? The Lincoln Memorial. So there's that connection between Wilmington and Abraham Lincoln. And there are a lot more connections that I could talk about if I had more time. Both of them are buried in Oakdale Cemetery. Okay, so geography played a big role in the success of blockade runners at Wilmington, where the success rate was about 80%. 80%. Where if a, a blockade running ship made a run from, say, the Bermuda to Wilmington, uh, investors stood to make about a 90% profit on that run. How did Rhett Butler make his fortune in Gone with the Wind? <laughs> As a blockade runner, right? And then he got Scarlett O'Hara, and then he did give a damn. <laughs> <clears throat> Before I retired, I used to mention Rhett Butler and Gone with the Wind to my students. They had no idea. <laughs> Time to go. Time to retire. Okay. So uh, these kinds of steamships, this was actually North Carolina's blockade runner. It's called the Advance. These ships would bring in vital supplies. They would load up with cotton, which was the main southern export, run out to Bermuda or Nassau, and then that cotton would be sent to uh, Europe. Um, and cotton that sold in the south for 8 to 10 cents a pound could sell in Europe for 50 cents to a dollar a pound. So cha-ching, 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 great fortunes could be made. In fact, I start one of my books with the story of James Chapman Stevenson from Wilmington, 16-year-old boy who made $50 in gold for every successful run through the blockade. He served on various blockade runners. And he said, at 16 years of age, I was making $25,000. That's the salary of President Jefferson Davis, which today would be half a million dollars at 16 years of age. He would take $50 in gold, invest in a 500 pound bale of cotton that could be sold in Europe for huge amounts of money. And he was making half a million dollars. I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> well, anyway. And the other thing, of course, that Wilmington had was lines of communication. It did no good for ships to get into Wilmington if there were not lines of communication to get the supplies to the needy whether it be the battlefront or the home front. And Wilmington had three railroads, the most important of which was the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad, which ran from Wilmington to Goldsboro to Weldon, North Carolina, where it connected to the Petersburg and Weldon Railroad. And that became the main supply route for General Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. And it became known as Lee's Lifeline, and then by late in the war, Lifeline of the Confederacy. When it was first completed in 1840, at 161 and a half miles long, the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad was the longest railroad in the world. Isn't the history of Wilmington great? I mean, I just go on and on and on. Okay. In fact, by 1864, so important was the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad that Robert E. Lee said, if Wilmington falls, I cannot maintain my army. The message was clear, the survival of the Army of Northern Virginia, the principal army for the Confederacy by 1864, and thus the survival of the Confederacy depended upon the survival of Wilmington as a blockade-running seaport. That's how important Wilmington was in our nation's history. Now, my friend Wilbur Jones has argued that it was more important during World War II no, it was not. It was more important during the Civil War. We had a public debate on that. I won. <laughs> okay. So obviously, with the growing importance of Wilmington as a blockade-running seaport, the Confederate government invested a lot of manpower and resources and money into protecting those interests. And that meant building fortifications, forts, batteries, field works, at the entryway to the river, along the beach strand to provide covering fire for the blockade runners as they were attempting to get in and out of the harbor, up and down the river, and then of course around the city itself. Because there was always the great fear, suppose Union forces in Newburn attack Wilmington overland. They just march from Newburn 90 miles southward and attack Wilmington from the north. Or suppose they land at Wrightsville Beach and attack by way of Bradley Creek or Hewlett's Creek. 
In fact, Nancy and I live at uh, a place called Camp Davis, not to be confused with the World War II Camp Davis. The largest Confederate encampment in the Lower Cape here was Camp Davis in our neighborhood on Greenville Sound. That's kind of an early warning system, so if Union forces landed at Wrightsville Beach, those forces would be there to slow them down until reinforcements could arrive. So these forts and batteries were absolutely crucial to the protection of Wilmington. And here's a period map, if you can see it, showing the extent, this great network of fortifications protecting Wilmington for the blockade running trade. So the forts protected the inlets that the blockade runners used. They protected the river that they went up and down. They protected the city where the supplies were offloaded and then cotton loaded onto the ships, and they protected the railroads along which the supplies were sent to the needy and the cotton was brought to town. This was absolutely ooh, the most important uh, city in the Confederacy by late 1864. Now, I gave Joe a copy of this Confederate engineer's map from 1864. Very hard to see, but I showed you that earlier map that showed the extent of the network of fortifications, but Wilmington was also guarded by fortifications. Again, for fear that the Yankees would attack Wilmington from the north and attack Wilmington where the defenses were weakest. So there was a strong line of fortifications that ran from Smith's Creek down what we call Burnt Mill Creek, which is not really Burnt Mill Creek, it's actually Green's Mill Pond, across Wrightsville Avenue, across Oleander Drive, and then right here, right where we're sitting, the lines of works ran, turned west at Battery Dawson, and went westward toward the Cape Fear River. This was a large, extensive line of fortifications. And here's a more detailed look. <laughs> Wilmington only extended to 13th Street where New Hanover High School is today. And of course it ran along the river. Uh, only later did it extend eastward. So uh, here's Market Street right here. And when it got beyond 13th Street, it was called the Newburn Road or the Topsail Sound Road. But the main road was Princess Place Drive. That was the Newburn Road, not Market Street. Uh, that was not extended until the 1850s. And in red, you can see the extent of the fortifications around the city and protecting it. And here's another view. I, again, I'm, I apologize for those of you in the back. You probably can't see this very well. But it's basically an, another Confederate engineer's map showing the extent of the fortifications in our area. And then in greater detail, I don't know if you can see it, there's... Dawson Battery and the line of earthworks that run between the, the ninth and the first fairway and it runs to the seventh hole called McCree Battery or Battery McCree which was named for a local doctor whose name was James F. McCree and he was instrumental in helping Wilmingtonians particularly during the devastating yellow fever epidemic of 1862 that killed six and a half percent of the population of the town. Yellow fever was the great scourge in those days. And so Confederate military authorities thought, man, this guy was so instrumental in saving so many lives, we're going to name a Confederate artillery battery after him. It's a big deal. I get a mound of dirt named after me? And all of a sudden, I get a, I get a road named for me? I get a billboard name? I mean, whatever, you, you know, Floats your boat. Anyway, this was an honor to get an artillery battery name for you. Okay, so here's Dawson Battery, right outside the back here. There are the earthworks that run between the 18th green and the 7th green. I love that. I mean, think about that. These things are still after 157 years. They are still here. It's absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I have to admit, I'm a Civil War geek. I'm an earthwork geek. I drive down the road and I'm looking for earthworks by the side of the road. And Nancy says, what are you doing? I'm looking for earthworks. Henry? They built them by hand. 
Henry, asked, Henry Temple asked, how were they built? They were built by hand. So no backhoes, no bulldozers. They used slave laborers, free black laborers, and Confederate soldiers. They were all working together, and they were using shovels and wheelbarrows, and that was it. And can you imagine coming out here in 1864, and they just hand you a shovel and say, okay, boy, go to work. Start digging. Uh, absolutely uh, amazing. And I just absolutely, I love that these things are still here. And most people, you know, we, we, we tee off on the ninth tee. Well, I wish I could come out. Can I come out and play a few rounds? Okay. Please invite me to come out. I have not played out here in, in 40 years. I'd love to come out here and play again. So you tee off on the ninth tee, and there are the earthworks, right there to your right. History is right there. Right there. That, that's a good question. How much have they eroded? Uh, as much as I've eroded in the 38 years that you and I have been married. <laughs> Maybe more. <laughs> they would have been about chest high so that a soldier could have stood on the north side and fired over the top of them with a musket. So these were sort of what, what you would call infantry works. Dawson battery, McCree battery, as I'm coming to, those were artillery batteries. And these are infantry curtains, they were called. And so if they, if they were attacked, then soldiers could stand behind them with their rifle muskets and fire over the top of them. And from the outside, the only thing that you could see would be the soldier's head. But underneath them, you would have uh, a trench and a firing step so the soldiers could step down into the trench and reload these single-shot rifle muskets that Jay Talbert knows so much about. And then you step up on the banquet or the firing step and you shoot and then you step back down and you can't be seen to be hit. They were ingeniously designed. But that's how they were built. One shovel full at a time. And in this view, you can see Battery McCree in the background. Okay. So there's Dawson Battery. There's Battery McCree. There's uh, Wright Battery, named for James Wright, who was also th the Wright family, Joshua Granger Wright. Um, so he was a doctor too, as was John Dillard Bellamy. So these three batteries were named for doctors here in Wilmington. Imagine naming something for doctors, right? <laughs> so in Battery McCree would have been one 24-pounder gun, an art artillery piece that in the early days, they were designed in 1819. I'm not going to get into this too much. Construction began in uh, 1820. The United States government manufactured uh, more than 1,100 of these cannons, and they called them seacoast artillery. Because these cannons, uh, at 5,800 pounds, 10 feet 4 inches long, and mounted in what was called in barbette, a French term meaning that they were put on these big giant wooden carriages to fire over the top of the artillery works. Once they're placed, they're very, very difficult to move. Unlike light artillery or field artillery that were on, could be pulled around by caissons. Horses and mules pulled them around to battlefields. Once these were put in place, they were virtually impossible to move. And eventually they became known as siege guns. And this is a 24-pounder, meaning that it fired a projectile that was 5.68 inches in diameter, and it weighed 24 pounds. And so that's the nomenclature. The cannon weighed almost three tons, but the ball weighed 24 pounds. Actually, a little bit more than 24 pounds. You want me to pass this around? Yeah, get a feel for this thing. <laughs> okay, so you would have cannoneers. It took five, five members of a gun crew to fire this thing. Four cannoneers and a gunner who was a non-commissioned officer, and he would give orders you know, to, on how to fire the gun. And they fired not only round balls like that, if they were smoothbore, if they were a rifle, they would fire cylindrical-shaped projectiles. 
The one here was a smoothbore gun. We know that because those are the projectiles we found. That came from Battery McCree. We found five of them. So it was a smoothbore gun, but we also found quite a bit of these canister or grape shot, and I'll pass these around too. This has been conserved so that it won't rust further. And then when it came out of the ground, it looked like that. I mean, after being in the ground for 150 plus years, you'd rust too. You'd have all kinds of bumps and pimples on you too. So I passed it around. And we have, in the last six months, had a conservator uh, conserve all of these uh, pieces. And eventually, there will be a nice display in the clubhouse with the history, the Civil War history uh, of the club. Uh, so they were fired from called canister if they were put into big giant tin cans. So these things would be filled with these iron balls and when they were fired from that big giant gun it was like a shotgun shell. So when you fired it the canister literally just disintegrated and then attacking infantry or cavalry had to contend with those iron balls coming their way. Or what essentially was a stand of canister or commonly referred to as grape shot. And they looked like that. Things with a big giant iron cap and a bottom and a ring that sort of kept them all together. And we found uh, a couple of larger balls uh, from this stand of grape. So these are the kinds of artifacts that we found up there. Oop. Okay. Uh, here at Battery McCree. And the fence line is right here, so that here's the old cemetery, and 16th and 17th Street would run right through here. So everybody's oriented. Okay. So from about halfway down the fairway of number one, that's what you're looking at that nice piece of high ground and you can understand why they built an artillery battery there and they were clearing it off when Joey called me uh, back in early March last year and um, we started digging it was like digging in sugar it's just pure white sand no salt whatsoever so the conservation uh, effort has gone on very quickly in some cases it can take years but in our case, with very little salt in the ground, uh, the conservation has gone fairly quickly. Is it no, that's a great question. The ball that's going around, where is that ball? <laughs> we found five of those balls. That is a solid piece of iron ball. It is. It weighs 24 pounds. That would not explode. Right. That would be a solid iron ball. If you were firing at a ship, it would tear up sails, masts, spars, maybe even puncture the side of a wooden hull ship. In the, this case, and I, I hate to be graphic, but you fire those balls against attacking infantry and cavalry because that would tear human and horses apart, absolutely tear them apart. But they also fired shells. That's a solid iron ball, but they also fired shells, meaning that they were, there was a cavity on the inside that was filled with gunpowder and a hole where you put a time fuse on it. And you fired it and you punched it or the, it was a, uh, a wooden fuse or, or paper fuse that was timed to go off in, t say, two seconds. The firing of these things was slow enough you could actually see the balls coming towards you. And that projectile weighed 17 pounds because, of course, it was hollow. Now, once you filled it up with gunpowder, it weighed approximately 24 pounds. And that, once the, the fuse uh, detonated, the ball exploded. And then you had to contend with fragments of balls like that, right? So it was a great question. Solid iron balls and shells. 
We found no shells up there. And of course, where was the cannon? What happened to the cannon? And what happened to the cannons in all the works? I think they were probably taken by the Yankees for fear that the, those rebels were going to do it all again after the war. Actually, I think they were probably taken and busted up for scrap drives during World War I and World War II. If you look at early photographs of downtown Wilmington, what do you see at the intersections of the roads? Old cannons. So that horse and buggies and then automobiles would not cut across the corners of the road. And three years ago, uh, March of 20, what's that, 2020, 2017, when they were doing work along Water Street, which they're doing now, they uh, uncovered an early 18th century cannon, 1715 to 1730, that we're going to have conserved and remounted at Riverfront Park. But that predated the American Revolution. Why was that there? I mean, it was in perfect shape. Why would they bury a cannon underneath Water Street? I have my theories, but there were cannons everywhere to protect Wilmington during the Revolutionary War, during the Civil War, and during World War II, like at Fort Caswell. Okay, so that's a great question. So, um, Chris Bird's friend, Gil Fagan from uh, Laura, South Carolina, came up uh, with his metal detector. I had my metal detector. We didn't have time to do uh, a, a, a proper archaeological excavation where you dig pits and you take measurements, all that. This was purely salvage archaeology because of the time constraints. Unfortunately, we're, we were unable to get up on top of the battery. I can imagine. Next time you play and you're putting on the seventh green, imagine all the history that's underneath you. There's still a lot of artifacts underneath that green. And, and Joey said, man, if you'd been here two weeks earlier, we could have hunted the top of the green. But they'd already uh, put in the, the sod and, or, or the, the, yeah, the gravel, and we, we couldn't hunt that. So we had to hunt the west and southern slope uh, of, the, uh, of the green. And uh, Gil came up with one time and hunted with me. He actually came up before I did. And then I spent uh, most of March and April, I was out here, gosh, every day for eight hours a day. I, I mean, I was like a kid in a candy store. I was just having a great time. And uh, Joey said, can, well, can we pay you anything? I said, are you kidding? I want to pay you. I'm having so much fun. And uh, so uh, I dug. And in fact, in, in this case, <clears throat> as you can see, we actually got uh, the, the course designer, uh, Andrew, uh, to take down about four feet of dirt because we were finding stuff as deep as our metal detectors would read. And we took off about four feet of dirt. And guess what? We were finding more stuff. So there's more stuff there. We just couldn't, we didn't have the time and our technology was limited that we just, we couldn't get to it. And so here's some photographs that I took of the excavations as I was doing them. This is a hole that's about um, 18 inches deep and you can see that I have dug grape shot and I've given you perspective with it. I was using long handle shovel and a folding Ames World War II shovel and again, most of what we found were these uh, canister balls. Ah, I'm glad you asked that question because I'm coming to that. Uh, we also found a few mini balls, which are lead rifle musket projectiles that weigh one ounce. They're called mini balls because a Frenchman named Minet, and it's gotten southernized over the years, mini balls. Smoothbore muskets fired round musket balls, like during the Revolutionary War. But eventually, they came up with rifled, uh, actually rifles go back to the 18th century, but they were new technology, they were way too expensive, but by the middle of the 19th century, that was the standard firearm, uh, single shot rifle musket. They had repeating rifles, Henry rifles and Spencer's, but they were too expensive. So the single shot rifle musket that fired a one ounce lead mini ball uh, was the standard firearm on both sides. And we found a few of those. I was actually surprised that we didn't find more. And we also found these cannon friction primers that are little pieces of brass about three inches high and they're filled with fulminated mercury. And at the end would be a twisted or braided wire 
And when attached to a lanyard, when you pulled the braid out, it created a spark that went down the tube of that friction primer into the breech of a cannon or the back end of a cannon and detonated gunpowder that had been pushed in bags all the way to the bottom. And when the gunpowder exploded, then it pushed out one of those 24 iron ball, 24 pounder balls or uh, those stands of grape or canister. So there's one of the 24 pounder balls as I dug it. I don't know if you can see the hole there, the way that they came out of the ground, almost like they were made yesterday. They were actually in pretty good shape, but they've been conserved and are in really nice shape now. All right, this is how deep one of those balls was. <clears throat> can you see that? I'm standing in a hole waist deep. It's a good looking digger there, isn't it, right? <laughs> Not bad for a 66-year-old guy. Anyway, I am standing waist deep, and that's how deep that ball was. So what's that? I'm five foot 11, so that's a, almost three feet. It's about three feet deep. Are there other balls deeper than that that I just couldn't read? I, I don't know. I don't, and we'll never know at this point. But I had to take a selfie of me standing in that hole. And you should have seen me trying to get the ball out of the hole. You couldn't just put a shovel underneath it and jerk it out like that. And I had to get down, I had to make the hole big enough that I could squat down, roll the ball up onto my toes, and then roll it up my legs. <laughs> I'm glad nobody was there to film this thing. <laughs> I really did look like a nerd. <laughs> and then get it up out of the hole. And in, the, in this case, it took me about 45 minutes to dig that hole and get that ball out of the hole. And I was so impressed with myself, I, I got to make a selfie of this. this. This is pretty cool. But I also wanted to give you all an idea of how deep these projectiles were. <clears throat> Stuart? Has anybody ever identified a central magazine for that battery where, the, where there might be a lot of shells? There, that's a great question because close by there would have been a magazine where there would have been gunpowder. So at each of these batteries, there would have been projectiles, but you've got to have gunpowder to fire the projectiles. And believe it or not, there was a magazine at battery right, which is the next battery down between 16th and 17th Street. But of course, they built that cemetery in there. Uh, that's on my list of things to try and find. It's on the map but is it still there? My guess is that buried deep but in, underneath the ground between 16th and 17th Street is a load of gunpowder. Wouldn't the city love to know about that? <clears throat> but Stuart, that's the closest, that's the closest battery that, or a magazine that I know of. G great question. Okay, well, were these batteries ever attacked? Uh, Fort Fisher is commemorating the 155th anniversary of the second Battle of Fort Fisher this weekend. I'm speaking twice. Y'all come on down. Um, these were the two largest naval bombardments of the Civil War. The January battle and yesterday was the 155th anniversary of the fall of Fort Fisher was the largest amphibious operation in American military history until D-Day World War II. Do y'all know that? The largest naval armadas assembled in modern history up to that time attacked Fort Fisher. It took them two attacks, took them Yankees two times before they finally got us. <laughs> and Fort Fisher fell, and then blockade running was closed to Wilmington. And as Lee predicted, if Wilmington falls, I cannot maintain my army. After capturing Fort Fisher, closing the harbor to blockade running, Union forces then turned their gun sights on Wilmington, advanced up both sides of the Cape Fear River, an armada of a uh, flotilla of gunboats on the river itself, advanced on the city and captured it on George Washington's birthday, 1865. And the fall of Wilmington was the Confederacy's last hope. When I wrote my first book, authors are always looking for a great title for their PowerPoint show, Battery on the Green. 
and I, I ran across a, a letter by Bill Calder's great, great grandfather, William Calder, from Wilmington. And he wrote that as they were leaving Wilmington, trudging through the darkened streets in the pre-dawn hours of February 22nd, heading into the interior states to join forces with other Confederates who were retreating into North Carolina in front of General Sherman's army, pushing through South Carolina, William Calder wrote, we could see a few lights shining from residences, and they appeared to us to be the last rays of departing hope. And I thought that was so symbolic. It was the last rays of departing hope for the Confederacy. And within 42 days after the fall of Wilmington, Robert E. Lee surrendered his army to U.S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, and the war ended. And that's how important Wilmington was. And that's the role that K. Fear Country Club played in that, uh, in that struggle. Uh, it's just great, great history. And by the way, when I was uh, researching Battery McCree, I ran across a newspaper article from 1906. Now, Bill's great-great-grandfather, William, and he's named for his great-great-grandfather, uh, fought for the Confederacy. He was in the 1st North Carolina Battalion of Heavy Artillery. His grandfather, Robert Calder, in 1906, and he was a Civil War geek like me, Bill, he and Mr. Bridgers, was it Robert Bridgers? Robert Bridgers? Clark. 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 Burke. Okay, Burke. He and Burke Bridgers walked the entire line of existing Confederate defenses. What's that? 41 years after the war's end. From Smith's Creek down Burke Mill Creek, so from Oakdale Cemetery through Wallace Park, all the way across uh, Riceville Avenue, across Oleander Drive, into what will become Cape Fear Country Club, to Dawson Battery, turn west, and walked all the way to the Cape Fear River, exploring those earthworks that were still there in 1906. And I mentioned that to Bill um, when I found the newspaper article about that quest. He said, Mr. Bridgers lived right next to us at Riceville Beach. I used to surf fish with him. I never knew this. And I was like, man, if I had known that, I would have been down there with y'all surf fishing every day asking Mr. Bridgers, tell me about those earthworks. The batteries were still there. Were the guns still there? Were the, the cannonballs still in the batteries? It wasn't that long ago. It really wasn't that long ago. And I love it. And I love my wife of 38 years. <laughs> who is spending her anniversary listening to me tell y'all about cannonballs and mini balls. God bless her. Thank you very much. Did I get that done in an hour? Perfect. Boom. Does anybody have any questions, comments, observations, hallucinations? Anybody? Yes, sir. Well, I, I'm glad you asked that because this line was never attacked. The, the outer city defenses that the Confederate military authorities thought would be necessary to keep the Yankees from attacking by way of New Bern. That never happened. The Federals actually blew it. They could have captured Wilmington earlier had they been more aggressive. In fact, one Union Naval Admiral wrote in his Civil War memoirs, had the Union captured Wilmington in 1862, or even 1863, the war would have ended at least a year earlier. And they did not. This line was never attacked. However, when the Union attacked Wilmington up what was called the Confederate Point Road, earlier the Federal Point Road, what we would call uh, Carolina Beach Road, which did not open until 1940, uh, the advance led them through the grounds of the Cameron Art Museum. 
and the Confederates had built another line of field works, not as strong or as big as these works, but another line of works a little bit further out. And so there was a battle at the Cameron Art Museum, or what locals refer to as the Battle of Jumping Run, because between here and there is Jumping Run Creek that feeds into Greenfield Lake. And so uh, the first time I was taken out there by old Doc Treadwell, do you all remember him, the veterinarian? He called this the Battle of Jump and Run. And uh, so it's the proximity of that battlefield to Jump and Run Creek. But these lines were abandoned before they were attacked. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, Bobby? About two miles. About two miles. Yep. And w what the Confederates would have done <clears throat> is they used the cypress swamps as part of the defenses. You would build your works up to the ponds and creeks and use them as sort of moats as part of the natural defenses. But they also cleared out the woods or thinned out the woods for about 600 yards south of the works for a military jargon, field of fire, so that any enemy forces that approached within 600 yards, the Confederates could see to fire on them. And those things, those cannons at 600 yards were deadly accurate. They could fire up to two miles. And I don't know if you all remember the artillery piece that I showed you uh, is among those that the Confederacy imported. It was a Whitworth, 12-pounder Whitworth rifle cannon made by Joseph Whitworth in Great Britain. Those things could shoot a fly off a post six miles away. So we think, well, 150 years ago, I mean, yeah, that's pretty crude, right? No, they were tech brilliant technicians at building artillery. And rifle muskets, so Jay can tell you, uh, they could hit a target at easily 350 to 500 yards away. And a Whitworth sharpshooting rifle, you could, you could hit a, a person 1,000 yards away. So these were very, very accurate weapons. I, I think, I, yes. The, the most famous piece of seacoast artillery at Fort Fisher was a, an 8-inch, 150-pounder Armstrong rifle cannon. The cannon tube itself weighed 6,000 pounds. It fired a projectile that was 8 inches in diameter and weighed 150 pounds. There were two of those weapons made by W.G. Armstrong and Company in England that were imported through the blockade into Wilmington in August of 1864 on a blockade runner called the Hope. And the commanding general here, William Henry Chase Whiting, was so impressed with the size of these things, he said, look, I've got to have these cannons here. So he uh, implored the Ordnance Department in Richmond, can you buy these cannons? I'd like to put them at Wilmington. And they put one at Fort Fisher and one at Fort Caswell. And when Fort Fisher and Fort Caswell were captured, the Army took the Armstrong gun from Fort Fisher and took it to where? West Point. At Trophy Point, overlooking the Hudson River. The largest collection in public that I know of, at least, of U.S. or, or of artillery that was captured during wars from the Colonial Wars all the way through the Middle Eastern wars going on now. There are hundreds of pieces of artillery, and the centerpiece of that collection at Trophy Point is Fort Fisher's Armstrong Rifle Cannon. And in 2006, Fort Fisher was actually able to borrow it for 16 months. And the Army fought that. They did not want Fort Fisher to have it for any length of time, but Jesse Helms <laughs> intervened. He was senator, yes! <laughs> and they brought that cannon back for 16 months. And, and to tell you how the federal government worked, they said, okay, we'll let you borrow it, but you've got to build uh, a concrete pad. 
You've got to build a carriage for that gun to sit on. We want you to build a security fence with motion sensors. Fort Fisher spent $75,000 to bring that cannon to Fort Fisher for 16 months. And my question was, who the hell's going to steal a 6,000-pound cannon <laughs> under any circumstances, much less break through a fence with motion sensors? So some redneck is going to drive down to Fort Fisher on Saturday night and throw that thing up on the back of his pickup truck and drive away? And you wonder why we're $23 trillion in debt. That's a perfect example. Yes, sir. Yes, that's absolutely true. It was called Moore's Battery. And next time you go uh, along Market Street, you get to 23rd Street, say you're going downtown. You get to 23rd Street, what do you do? You dip down, right? And then you go back up at about 20th Street. That was a flooded mill pond called Green's Mill Pond. That is not Burnt Mill Creek. Burnt Mill Creek, the real Burnt Mill Creek, is on the uh, west and north side of Oakdale Cemetery. So when you go into the old section of Oakdale Cemetery, my family's buried in there, and I know many of your families are buried in there. One-fourth of me will be buried in there one day. The other th three quarters will be blown out of three different cannons. <laughs> I'm serious. I told Nancy, Blow me out of Canada. I mean, what a better way to go. But I don't want to go out with a bang. I want to go out with a bang, bang, bang. But anyway, the, the creek on the west and north side is Burnt Mill Creek that flows into what we call Burnt Mill Creek today, but it's really Greens Mill Pond Channel. And as you go west on Market Street and you go down the dip, you cross the creek and you go up, Look at the National Cemetery, and you can actually see the tears of the old Moore's Battery. And Union soldiers, both black and white, who were killed during the Wilmington Campaign and at Fort Fisher, starting with them, they were buried there. So the Union took control of that area, which was an old farm, and in 1865, they buried their dead there, and in 1867, it was incorporated as a national cemetery, and it's one of five national cemeteries in North Carolina but you can still see the tears of old Moore's battery. Anybody else? Well, I've loved being with y'all tonight. It's, thank you very much for coming. <clears throat> it's been great. And I hope to see you out on the golf course. <laughs>